man. I didn't know we were going to need so many Kleenex already. <laughs> Anybody else? <laughs> Praise the Lord. It's a good day to be in church. I'm just going to take a few moments to pick up where Pastor Jeff left off and just talk about the Church Builders campaign for 2020. So let me just hit a couple highlights. I want to show you guys a map and give you a little more scoop on what's going to happen this year. So let me grab my notes here. Uh, our goal this year, as Pastor Jeff mentioned, is 700,000, 350,000 toward debt reduction, 350,000 toward broadcasting the basics to the world. And so here's our scripture. This is a great passage. Of course, you guys have heard it many times, but Matthew 16, verses 18 through 19 says, Jesus said, I will build my church. And all the people said, amen. amen. Jesus is building his church. And the gates of hell, or Hades in this version, shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So it's interesting, right on the heels of the passage about building the church, he talked about keys. And so this year, as Jeff mentioned, we're going to use a key instead of a light bulb, kind of as our symbolic point of contact, point of reference, when people give, we're going to put a key up on the board as kind of an indicator, a symbol. But, you know, keys um, represent authority. Keys represent the ability to open a door. And so it is, it is an interesting thing to meditate on and to ponder. Um, I posted something the other day. Just I, I like this little phrase. It said, old keys won't open new doors. And there's something about that in 2020, you know, our whole theme is reinvent 2020. And all of us need some new keys, don't we? I mean, anybody want to open some new doors this year? Anybody want the Lord to open up some new things for us? But old keys, old ways of operating, old ways of doing things aren't going to open the new doors. And so in this particular passage, it's like Jesus said, hey, I'm giving you the key. I'm giving you keys of authority. I'm giving you the key. You are the key in some ways you could say. Jesus, that is, is the key. And we have his name, we have his word, we have his blood, we have the angels of God. We have all the power we need to live the life he's called us to, including, as they just sang about, the life of generosity. And you guys know one of our core values around here is generosity defines us. And it's not just a little cliche, it's like a lifestyle. It's like we adopt that generous spirit that the Lord has in every way, not just financially. I mean, right now we're talking about finances, but just in general. We're generous towards people. We're generous in our words. We're gracious. We're patient. You know, we're generous with our time and so on. And I know a lot of you guys volunteer here. You give your time. You are generous with your time. But there's something about that key of generosity that opens up some new doors. And we want you guys to take a faith adventure this year. Some of you, this is old news. You've been doing it for many years. Others of you, it's kind of a new thing, this idea of giving to the Lord. But if you'll do it in faith... Nobody's going to twist your arm. God's not. We're certainly not either. But if you'll do it by faith, just as a choice, and then just watch what God will do. We've done it. Many of you have done it for years and years. I mean, you just can't outgive God. If you'll, if you'll choose to be a conduit, he will find a way to bring increase into your life that can flow through you. Don't, you know, don't, don't stop it up. Be the conduit. You know how in the Bible, Jesus said this, uh, or Paul said this in Corinthians, he said, God is the one who gives seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So you have to discern in your life, is this seed to sow or is this bread to eat? In other words, with our income, you get a special bonus, you get some unexpected things, you have to say, Lord, is this seed to sow or is this bread to eat? And a lot of us in seasons of our lives, and Jeff and I will tell you some stories later in, in the year, but we've had many seasons, we knew it was a seed to sow season. Eventually, we would eat the bread, but this wasn't an eat the bread season. This was a seed to sow season because God gives seed to who? The sower. The sower. Yeah. So what I'm trying to say is if you'll hook up your heart and faith this year, then God will make you a conduit. He will give you seed to sow. It ends up being a win-win. People sometimes think, oh, they're talking about giving. They're talking about, you know, the campaign, and people think sometimes it's a win-lose. Church wins, you lose. But that's not how God works. God's always a win-win. And he's the one that gives seed to the sower. Now, it takes faith 
to say, oh, this is seed to sow, not bread to eat, not money I should use to eat and do the stuff I want to do right now. There will be that season of harvest, but God, by faith, we had, I'll just tell you this really quick. We had a season many, many years ago. We had four little kids. I think I was pregnant with Eric. And we recognized these people are expensive. <laughs> Anybody else notice? Kids are expensive. And we knew at some point, you know, one or all of them might need braces and they want to play sports and they need uh, uniforms and camp. And, you know, we realized all that. And we're pioneering a church. We're not making any, hardly any money. So we're like, you know, Lord, we need, some, we need some harvest coming in from some other ways. But we knew that was a season to sow. And we said one day, we said, okay, any, well, we decided, we said, let's pick five projects to sow into, $100 for each project, so $500 a month for us in that season. That was a lot of money. It's a lot of money for us now. And that was a car payment. And we said, we're going to forget the car payment. We're going to forget getting a new car. We're going to do seed to sow right now, not bread to eat. We're going to sow 500 bucks a month into these five different areas of ministry. And uh, we're just going to trust God. We have got to get some seed in the ground because in a few short years, we're going to need a harvest. We're going to need some bread to eat to put some braces on these kids, to send them to sports camp, right? So that was a choice. But I'll tell you what, for us, it was the beginning of getting into God's economic flow and getting into God's laws of seed time and harvest. It was the beginning. And we sowed and we sowed and we sowed, and it was a sacrifice for that year. And we didn't see a big harvest after that year. We didn't, it wasn't, wasn't like when the clock turned one year, God said, okay, boom, here, be blessed. It wasn't like that. But over time, that harvest started to come in and we kept sowing. And that harvest started to come in, and pretty soon we're in a season where we've got seed to sow and bread to eat. And that's God's highest and best. But it starts with seed to sow. I'm just trying to share that little nugget with you. Amen? So we're talking about building the church. We're talking about the keys of the kingdom. Here's our goal locally. Let me just show you this with a map. Our local goal is to pay down more of the principal on VFC's $8 million mortgage. Why? How will this help VFC? It'll set up the next generation to reach people in Southwest Michigan. It'll reduce the interest payment. Let's get that down, down, down. It will free up funds to continue Valley Groceries. It will free up funds to upgrade, as Jeff mentioned, the outdated tech. I mean, they can't even repair some of it because there's no parts. So there's a lot of things that paying down the mortgage will help free up. Here's a map. I just want you guys to see a map in terms of the outreach of VFC. So this lets you see kind of the influence of VFC between weekend attendance and Valley Groceries because people come from all over for the groceries. It's amazing. Where you see the darkest green in the very middle, of course, that's right here where we are, 8,000 to 12,000 people came to VFC in this last year in that area. That's a lot. Then you see the next one, the next darker screen, 2,000 to 8,000, 500 to 2,000, and the next green, you can kind of get the idea. So there's a lot of people, we say it this way, you know, there's 11,000 people, another little nugget for you, there's 11,000 people in Kalamazoo County, or in, on this map, let's put it that way, Michigan, 11,000 people that consider VFC home. Like, they don't go to any other church, this is their church. But the thing is, they only come five times a year or less. I mean, statistically. Christmas, Easter, maybe another special event. Our goal is to get those 11,000, you can see them on the map, <laughs> to get them to come more regularly and then to help us go into the rest of Southwest Michigan and reach more people. Amen? So anyways, your giving helps us to do all that. I mean, we're already doing it to, to the degree that you see there, but boy, oh boy, Without the burden of the debt, it would be so much more liberating for all the areas of ministry. And everybody that understands that said, Amen. the local campaign, the goal is 350000 Each pledge of $500 equals one key. Our goal is 700 keys. You play a key role in filling up our church builder's board. How many keys will you pledge to build the church? Okay, now the global outreach, let me tell you about that really quick. The global outreach, 
is this. Our goal is to cover the annual cost to produce and air VFC's Bible Basics Outreach Ministry. That includes the television show, that includes the Basics University, that includes a few other things, but it's primarily television, although it does include like the podcast and other things as well. How will this help VFC? We will take heart in knowing we are fulfilling Jesus's command to go into all the world and preach the gospel. We will be doing our part to make and strengthen disciples in the basics of the Bible. We will broadcast daily and weekly in various parts of the world, especially in unreached places like the Middle East. You guys have heard us tell you this, but we air the, pro the Basics with Beth broadcast. It's the Getting a Grip on the Basics program, among a few others. In the Middle East, Iran, Afghanistan, Tajikistan, and other parts of the Middle East that are highly persecuted, in Iran, they've just reported recently, Iran has a pretty powerful underground church, and it's led crazy. Listen to this. It is led by women, which is a crazy thought. It is led by women in Iran. There's this underground movement, and they are just preaching the gospel. And it's so funny to me that the Lord, because we, we weren't really looking to air the program in the Middle East. The opportunity presented itself, and it cost $11,000 a year. Not very expensive for that, to air once a week in the Middle East. They want us to air every day. If we had $11,000 for every day, we'd do it. So anyways, they told us that these women are leading so many churches in the Middle East. So I think it's funny, of all the people, I mean, there's a lot of people that air over there, I guess, but of all the people that the Lord would say, hey, you go teach the basics over there, he picked a woman to help the women, to help encourage and teach them the basics so they can teach their congregations. I just think that's so cool of the Lord to do it that way. So anyways, we air the program a lot of places. Here's a map. I want you guys to see this. I know it's small, but in the darkest areas, of course, you see that's where a lot of the persecuted church is, the darkest blue, the persecuted church, and we do air in some of those places. We actually even air in some parts of China, in some parts of India, but throughout the Middle East. Then you see the next darkest blue. That is where we have the television program. So you can see it covers a lot of places, like the whole world pretty much. And the darkest blue is where we have not only the television program, but the basics book, Getting a Grip on the Basics, the book is translated into all of those languages. It's in 22 languages now. And those 22 languages cover most of the earth, which is crazy. And it's a free download. We let missionaries and people download it completely for free in their language so they can make disciples. That's that secondary blue. Then the next blue down <clears throat> is just the TV show. I know it's hard to discern, but we'll put this map out in the atrium. You can see it a little better. The lighter blue is just where the books are. No TV show, just the books. And then the gray, you can see a few little gray spots. The gray is unreached, like we're not there. <clears throat> we're not doing anything there, so it is hard to see which ones are gray. I think on the top left of Africa, no, make that right. No, make that left. My left. <laughs> You're right. Top left, up in that corner, that's gray, so it's hard to see. But So there's a couple places that the TV program is not broadcast. But anyways, nonetheless, Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. So a lot of us aren't going to get on an airplane and go to these places, but thank God, through television, through technology, through the internet, through smart TV like Roku, Apple TV, we can get into countries and get into places and the governments can't stop it. We can get the gospel to the whole world. The 2020 Church Builders Global Campaign for uh, the global side, for what I just told you about, is 350, 350,000. Each pledge is $500 equals one key. Our goal is 700 keys. You play a key role to helping to fulfill our church builders board. How many keys will you pledge to the program this year? And then finally, this verse, Jesus said it, so let's be a part of it. Come on, let's be a part of what Jesus is doing. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And all the people said, amen. amen. So you got a couple weeks and you know, even a couple of months to turn in your cards. But boy, the sooner we all do it and we can jump on this, the better. Okay? Praise the Lord. Wow. <clears throat> That'll uh, get you going, won't it? You know, there's nothing like worshiping God. I'll tell you what. There's nothing like it. No substitute. And I, trust me, I've tried all the substitutes. Nothing gets you as high as Jesus. 
Praise the Lord. The Most High. Come on, somebody. The Most High. <laughs> All right. Let me, let me relax. I want to talk to you about closing the financial gap. You know, we've been talking the last several weeks. Is this year is our year to reinvent. And so we're sharing throughout the year just ways that God has helped us to reinvent our life. It's just some practical things. And so there's lots of resources on our website that we've talked through uh, about, about the gap and from the real and ideal. And I want to talk to you today about the financial gap and specifically about how to move from never enough to more than enough. From never enough to more than enough. So when God introduced himself to Abraham, who, by the way, is known as the father of our faith, Father Abraham, you learned that probably in children's church. When he introduced himself to Abraham in Genesis chapter 17, he said these words. He said, I am the almighty God. And in the Hebrew, almighty God there is, is the Hebrew words El Shaddai. And it means the God who is and has more than enough. He's El Shaddai, not El Get By. So when we come into a relationship with Jesus, who is the son of the God who is more than enough, then we enter into a relationship with the God who has everything we need. That was his promise to Abraham. To say, Abraham, if you will follow me, I will help you and lead you along the way so that you will have, as I do, more than enough. That was his promise to Abraham, and that's his promise to all of us. Did you know that 78% of Americans live from paycheck to paycheck? That's in rough terms, 8 out of 10 of us live from paycheck to paycheck, which means then if there's that many, if the percentage is that high, then those living by paycheck to paycheck, it's not determined by the amount they're paid. That's not the issue. Meaning if, you're, if, it's, not, if it's a little bit or a lot, 80% of those little bits and lots are all living from paycheck to paycheck. And so if that's the case, then I, I think it's safe to say then that you'll never move from never enough to more than enough until you learn how to. I like something Dave Ramsey says. In fact, we're going to show a couple of video clips that he uses in his teaching to, this morning to all of us to encourage us in our, in our faith. But one thing he says is we don't have a math issue. We have a behavior issue. And I think behaviors are changed by what we believe. If we don't believe our behavior will ever change, it will never change. If we believe... We'll never have enough. We will never have enough. But if we begin to change our believing and changing our behavior, I'm here to tell you that things can change, and we can move beyond there. In other words, living from paycheck to paycheck is not going to change unless there's some sort of either supernatural intervention. In other words, if I could just throw pixie dust at everybody and make it change, I, I wish I could. I can't. But outside some behavioral change, it's, it's not going to happen. So the question is, how do we change our thinking? How do we change our believing? Well, we have to connect ourselves to God and his word. So let's start with the fundamental. The fundamental is we are surrendered to Jesus. We give him the lordship of our life. That means the lordship of every part of our life. That means every part of us, including our finances, are the Lord's. We, we, we submit it to him. Here's what Jesus said. He said, no one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. Pretty, dis pretty big discrepancy, hate to love. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. Hate, love, devoted, despise. And he goes on to say this, you cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. So he's specifically talking about this fight, this tension between serving God or finding ourselves serving money. And I think it all comes down to a decision about whether or not we're going to serve God, seek him first, Matthew 6.33, and all these 
things will be added unto us. There's this idea that it's a change of thinking. It's, it's a different way to view life, a, a paradigm shift, if you will, which all of us can do. We can all change how we think, change how we approach this. Because, again, changing how we think changes how we believe. Changing how we think and how we believe changes our behavior. Now, if you ever wondered if there's a reality here, if there's truth to this idea of you can't serve God and money, well, then I would encourage you to uh, swing by one of our local casinos. <clears throat> now, as, uh, I know I'm talking about a casino in church. It's okay. Just relax, okay? But there's a casino about 20 miles to the east of us and about another one 20 miles to the west of us and another one about 20 miles to the north of us. And if you've ever driven by those casinos, as most of us do, drive by them, hopefully, uh, but you, you notice something, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, what's the common thing you see in all of them? Packed parking lots. In fact, the, the one up north, the um, Gun Lake Casino, they're building a, a parking ramp. There's so many cars there all the time. So, I, 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 so, so that's the tension here. In other words, those parking lots are filled. Ours are filled a morning a, a week. One morning, one day a week. Their parking lots filled every day, every hour of every day, all week long, all year long. Don't tell me there's not tension between serving God or serving money. Now, here's a, here's a diff. Those people there, they freely give their money. To something that's only temporary. In other words, if you hit the big jackpot and you win a million dollars and you die on the way home, you're not taking that million dollars with you. Just a thought. I had, I had lunch or a dinner uh, recently with one of the executives of Firekeepers down here in Battle Creek. And uh, we were just talking about life and what, what he did and his position. And he was sharing with me that they have a problem. You know what their problem is? Too much money. They don't know what to do with it all. I said, well, I can relate to that. <laughs> Not ever said by ever any pastor on the planet. No, but so what they're doing is they're investing in the community because they got so much money. They're buying businesses. They're building restaurants. They're investing in the community because of all the money that people are freely giving them. This is just amazing. So who are you going to serve? It's a decision you make. Because you'll serve somebody, the Lord, or you'll serve money, and ultimately what happens is then you serve debt. The Bible says, just as the rich rule the poor, so the borrower is servant to the lender. I want to show you a video. I'm going to show you three videos that to a progression of people who found themselves in a really tight spot financially, then began to put things into practice that will change that behavior, and then you're going to see the result, the fruit of that behavioral change. Let's take a watch to this first video. Everything that took our parents 30 years to achieve, we wanted it. Right away. Right then. We had a, a nice big house in the Suburban that was brand new, and two kids and a white picket fence, and we thought we were really living the American dream. I did the whole thing where you sign like one application your freshman year, and you get like five billion credit cards. My mother it kind of expected me to live that way. Well, why shouldn't we live to the standard she was living? My whole philosophy was, ah, I'll just work another week. <laughs> Swipe the card, work another week, swipe the card. I got this, right? My thing was, if, if I want it, then I need to have it myself. But I also had a very strong sense of self-entitlement. Like, I needed to reward myself for all the good things that I've ever done. We couldn't just have any apartment. We had to have a downtown loft apartment. We couldn't just have any car. We had to have a convertible, a brand new convertible. I bought some land, just kept adding up, adding up, and I bought this, bought that. When I graduated, I had probably more credit card debt than I should have had, student loan debt. We put all these upgrades in our house. Well, we had to remodel. Oh, we did, of it course. Was, it, it was very important to remodel. It had to have travertine floors. But we were completely house, completely house poor. I spent a lot of money on things that later probably had very little to no value. 
I was never late on payments, I was never behind. I was living paycheck to paycheck. We were just doing what was normal. Jesus tells a story. In fact, he often, more often than not, told parables and told stories. One of the stories talks about this issue, this idea of how we manage the things that God gives us. The story goes like this. Again, the kingdom of God, Jesus said, can be illustrated by a story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted them with his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportion to their abilities that he left on his trip. The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money, and he earned five more. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. The servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. After a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of how they had used his money. The servant to whom he had entrusted the five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest, and I have earned five more. The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount. So now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. The servant who had received the two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest. I have earned two more. The master said, Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Then the servant with the one bag of silver came and said, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid. I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here is your money back. The master replied, you wicked and lazy servant, if you knew I I harvested crops I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. Then he ordered, take the money from this servant and give it to the one with the ten bags of silver. To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have, it will be taken away. Let's go back to that first verse of this story. Notice the principles of the kingdom of heaven. The first thing we do as believers in Jesus is we decide we are going to live kingdom laws and kingdom laws principles. We are kids of the king. We're going to live in his kingdom. In fact, when Jesus began preaching, you know what his first messages were? His messages were the kingdom of God is at hand. In other words, the possibility to live life differently is here. And it's a decision and it's a, and it's a, a decision of our mind that ultimately is, changes how we believe and ultimately how we behave. Some people think we have a relationship with God by behaving differently. But that's just the difference by believing differently. You all with me? So he says that he he uses the story, and he said he called together his servants. That's us. The story is about us. His servants, that's us. And he entrusted them with his money until when he was gone away. In other words, Jesus is now at the right hand of heaven until he returns. But he's given all of this to us, which means as believers, we believe all of this, everything we have is God's. Now, it's all his, but he's entrusted us with 90% of what comes to us. In other words, the tithe is not us uh, just deciding to, to give it to God. It's like, no, we're returning what's his acknowledging that we would much rather have our 90% blessed than trying to live life 100% on our own. 
You all with me? Kingdom principles. So here's what he did. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to the other, and one bag of silver to the last one, dividing it in proportion to their abilities. In other words, it's not about a money issue. It's just about how you manage what you've been given. One was given five, one was given two, one was given one. They each could have doubled it if they worked at it. One invested it, that's the five. One worked it, that's the two. And one simply buried it and hid it and didn't do the work. And ultimately, it cost him. It cost him what? Everything. Because what he had was then given to the guy who produced the five. So, here's what I want you to see. I want you to see it's not just a change of thinking, but it's a change of thinking that directs a change in our behavior. So, you saw that first video, which was, which was this identifying that there are some people in financial trouble. This is your paycheck to paycheck people that were living paycheck to paycheck and accumulating debt along the way until now it becomes massive and they don't know what to do. And so I'm going to share with you just four simple things that all of us can put into practice that I, we put into practice in our life. We know this works. So here's the four things. Number one, do a financial review. We're going to talk about that in just a second. Number two, save $1,000 in emergency fund. Have $1,000 that you save on purpose not to touch. You're going to set it off to the side in case something happens. Number two, eliminate all your non-mortgage debt. And number four, give to God and build this church. All right, before we talk about those, I want us to see step two of this video. So let's see our, our folks. This downward spiral just began, but we couldn't really see what was happening. We were blinded by it, I think. It's a mindset where you don't even realize how much you spend as you swipe. We really had no emotional attachment to anything. Everything kind of started to crash because I wasn't making the money that I had been making. I couldn't keep up with my credit card payments. But it still didn't click to me that there was a way for me to change it or there was a way for me to fix it. I was starting to feel the weight of, of everything. That you know, We had this car loan. We had now two student loans that were um, we couldn't defer any more that we had to make these payments on. We were bordering on bankruptcy. I remember, um, like, searching through our junk drawer for change just because I wanted to just go get a snack and take my screaming child out for a ride in the car to calm her, and I couldn't find any, any change. Went over to Michigan to see my buddy in Grand Rapids. Um, in the course of that, I blew up my motorcycle. <laughs> I'm sitting there looking at my wallet. I got these credit cards. Every one of them maxed out. So I call the credit card company, and I'm begging the gal on the other end of the phone to extend me another $1,000 limit so I can get, which was $25,000 I had maxed out, all of them. I've had sleepless nights with the debt and the payments and the, mm -hmm. everything else that we got, or the mess we gotten into. That was a, a big moment for me, was how, you know, what are, how are we going to handle this? I could see that my balance on my student loans was so super low, but I couldn't pay it off because I charged these credit cards back up, and now I've got to pay them off again. I could have been out of debt so much earlier had I just cut the cards up. One of the first steps is to figure out your net worth. It was negative by six figures. And we went, oh no, what, what, what have we done? So January 7th of 2013, and I still carry to this day, and I will carry to my grave, is my debts. Sat down, I wrote them all out. <sighs> Said I ain't living like this anymore. So there you go. They did a financial review and came to the truth that they were in trouble. The same thing happened to me in the early 1980s when the economy in Michigan went in the tank. And I found myself doing a financial review, looking at my finances, looking at my debt I'd accumulated as just a young man, and realized at the time that I was $28,000 in the hole. 
And for me, it was a, a realization that I couldn't get out of that hole by myself, that I needed help. And I had no one to turn to. Couldn't go to a bank. Couldn't go to my parents. They had recently retired. I knew they didn't have money to, like that to just give me. Where else do you go? Where, where do you turn? Well, you turn to God. And you sure hope there is one. And a friend had been telling me about Jesus. This idea that you could follow him and that he would forgive you of your sins and it would help you with your life. I didn't know anything about El Shaddai. Never heard, didn't know any Hebrew. Didn't know much of the Bible. But I know I was in trouble. And I knew that I needed help. And so I turned to him. I turned to Jesus and asked him to be the Lord of my life and to help me. That's why I'm passionate about this subject, and I share it with you with a, not a heart to get anything from you. It's really here just to help. I want to help your life. So it starts with a review. So you, when you came in this morning, you got a, something I've used for years with our family. This is a, a, just a, I call it the annual budget worksheet. On the first page, front page, <clears throat> it says income. Different in, you might have different income streams, whatever you fill up, but what's your total income? on an annual basis, and then I'll try to think through all the different expenses. And I would fill this out each year. I'd fill it out and, and see how are we going to do with all these various items. And so that's that'll be step one. Take this and use it. Those of you watching online, you can download it tomorrow on our website. It'll be on our resources page uh, for this uh, whole year full of resources and our reInvent journey together. But also I want you to see a, a simple way to do it. If that seems like too much, then one way to look at this is just on a monthly basis. Look, here's how you would do it. Just List your monthly income. You probably get paid, you know, if you get paid weekly, that would be four paychecks, biweekly, two paychecks. But what is that income? Then what are your expenses that month? And then what do you got left? Now, if that's a negative figure, you've got to do something. You've got to change what you're doing. It's not just going to change on its own. And so uh, here's a, 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 an, an app you can get through Dave Ramsey. It's called, it's free, by the way, called everydollar.com. You can go to that website and download the app. It's awesome. It tracks your expenses. It's so simple and so easy. It's a great way to get, a, you know, get an idea of your financial situation. Now, I say all that to say that's step one. Step one is to do a financial review. Step two is this idea of saving. Just saving some money for an emergency because so oftentimes when we try to get ourselves out of debt, we find out, oh, all of a sudden there's an emergency. Some, my tire went bald. My dishwasher stopped working or something. But if you had a little bit of money just set to the side for those, you could continue to work on moving forward and have a little bit of emergency money. Say, why $1,000? Is there any magic to that number? There's no magic at all. It's just a figure. And what it is is a figure all of us can reach. All of us can get there. Now, it might take some of us longer than others, but we can get there. And why? Because you need to see that it can work. In other words, having victories along the way help change our behavior. So number, number three is eliminate your non-mortgage debt. Now, how do you do it? I love this principle. It's, from Dave, it's another one of Dave's principles, but it's called the debt snowball. And so if we look at these pictures here, here's the, here's, let's say you have three debts. Small, medium, and large. What, what people want to say, well, well, what's the biggest interest rate? What's the biggest, you know, which one should I tackle first? Well, real simple. Forget the interest rate. Just attack the smallest one first. In other words, pay minimum amount on the largest in the middle. Pay the most you can possibly pay on the smallest and eliminate that debt. Once that debt is eliminated, you take that money you were spending on the smallest one add it to the middle one, and start attacking that until that is eliminated. Once that's eliminated, you take the smallest, the middle, and you add those together and attack the largest debt until that's eliminated. Now, here's the purpose for that. Why that? Each step along the way is victory. And before you know it, you're gonna, your behavior is going to change, and you're going to find the fact you're never going to go into debt again because you've learned how to stay out of it and get out of it. Isn't that good? That's just simple, easy, simple plan. So that's the whole idea of the debt snowball. So financial review, save $1,000, eliminate your non-mortgage debt. And then finally, this is the thing. Get in God's economy. Do stuff for heaven. Invest in eternity along the way. And you can do both of these things and still, you know, buy a key or whatever it might be over the next year or buy several keys, whatever it might be for you. But get involved with God's economy and see what God can do.
Is that just a great promise, or does it really, really happen in people's lives? Well, let's see from our people what happened to their lives when they put these simple principles to practice in their lives. Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, it's the Dave Ramsey Show. What's up? I'm here to do my debt-free screen. It's a lot to pay off, but we're not going back. I can't believe that it was that large of a dollar value. We had a lot of difficult decisions that we made throughout the seven years that we were on our journey. How much have you paid off? I paid off $120,000. $394,000. $162,000 in seven years. $456,607.92. Wow! Does that include your home? It does not. Whoa! We were hyper, hyper focused. Cut up my credit cards. I cut everyone up, I canceled them, I did all that stuff. We literally started selling our furniture. We had no furniture in our living room for seven years. People would come to my house and be like, well, how long have you been here? Like, where's your furniture? And we sold my car, which was a great car. I cried the whole way home. I was like, what have I just done? I got rid of my car and now I'm driving in this beater. They were kind of looking at me like, this girl is crazy. <laughs> I just started hitting it. Started with the first one, got that one knocked out. We would be sitting there at dinner like going, okay, and if we sold this and if we did that and if, 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 if. So it started this like, Snowball effect of I sell, he sell, sell <laughs> I sell, he sell. Kids probably were terrified we were going to sell them next. So I worked three weeks on, one week off, or 18 months straight. My week off, I didn't go anywhere, I didn't do anything. In fact, I picked up a little extra cash. Just went gazelle, man, like nobody's business. We started selling stuff and uh, we got pretty radical. What would you think if I sold? My convertible and she's well i'm not gonna ever tell you you have to but sell okay. your baby i don't think it really hit me until i paid off my student loan they send you a letter that essentially says your balance is zero what do you tell them the keys are when people hear you've gotten out of debt don't give up so <laughs> what was the hardest part of this it's been seven years and our kids are 16 and 14 now so it was really hard to learn to say no to them mm -hmm. um, and to know that they'd be okay and that we were actually giving them a better lesson the weight off your shoulders, mm -hmm. huh? Nobody owns me no more. That's the hugest thing of all. Nobody owns me anymore except him. Yeah. How do you keep with it for seven years? We kept dreaming. Yes. It's a big thing for us. Now there's just peace and it's a freedom. Freedom. Count it down. Let's hear a great debt-free scream. Three, three, two, Three, two, one. two, one. I'm debt-free.